Hi, I'm Dave Lyon. I'm the president of PCSI, Pacific Communication Sciences Incorporated. PCSI is a subsidiary of Cirrus Logic Incorporated. I've been involved in the design and implementation of digital communication systems uh, since 1967, and I'm here today to talk about wireless communications, especially digital wireless communications. And before we start with the theory and uh, the details of the engineering principles, I thought I might illustrate what it is we're going to talk about today with these two wireless telephone sets that I have here. This one here is a analog cellular telephone. It's relatively recent technology, has a retractable antenna, weighs about 12 ounces, about 350 cubic centimeters in volume, and with this large battery, I can talk for about two hours on this set, or I can stand by and wait for calls for about eight hours on this battery. This is an analog cellular phone. Here, I have a digital cordless phone, one used in what is called microcellular systems. This one was designed for the Japanese personal handy phone system, RCR28. This phone is only about four ounces, about 120 cubic centimeters, and it operates with a very small battery that, in fact, will support two hours of talk time like the analog cellular phone but this one will support 30 hours of standby waiting for calls. Why are these phones so different in size? Why do they deliver such different performance? That's the topic today. And I've organized the discussion into four sections. The first section, I will talk about the principles of digital communications, not necessarily over radio or wireless channels, but digital communications over any type of channel. Then we will talk about the special problems that come in transmitting information, communicating over radio channels or wireless channels. We'll then, in the third section, spend a little bit of time talking about the economic implications of these systems. And finally, we'll lay out a timeline of different kinds of wireless systems, both cellular and microcellular systems to look at their history and also what we see coming in the next few years. To focus our discussion further on this first slide, I show a general block diagram of a wireless communication system. And you'll see that starting at the bottom with the wireless handset or telephone handset, we have a number of different elements that all have to work together to deliver wireless communication services to the subscriber. So starting with the mobile station, MS, we talk to the base stations, which are arranged and all interconnected to a mobile switching center, or MSC. In turn, the MSCs are interconnected to one another and to the public switch network. In today's discussion, we focus almost strictly on the very bottom of the diagram, the radio channel communication between the base station and the mobile station. That is our focus because it is in understanding the communications principles and the physics of that channel that we can answer the questions that I've just posed. To understand wireless digital communications, we are first going to talk about digital communications and even more generally what the nature of a communication system is. As you can see on the next diagram, in general, we talk about sources of information and their destinations. Mathematicians refer to them as the sources and sinks of information. And finally, we have the channel. And the channel both conveys information, but also it can corrupt the information. And in fact, the art and science of communication engineering is to build transmitters and receivers for channels to offset the corrupting nature of real physical channels. In the next slide, you'll see that we've added a few additional pieces to our model. Uh, first, now we talk about a transmitter, which is capable of sending information in the form of some type of waveform. And the waveform will have a property that we refer to as the signal power, signified by S here in the diagram. The channel itself now has two properties that are important. One is the clear channel bandwidth, uh, called W here which is measured in hertz or cycles per second. Uh, 
the second property is the noise power here signified by n, which is measured in the normal uh, dimensions of power or watts. And finally, of course, the combined signal and noise uh, are all delivered to the receiver. In uh, the late 40s, uh, Claude Shannon uh, published a very famous result called the capacity theorem. And he proved that over such a channel, the number of bits per second of information could not be delivered reliably at a rate greater than the expression here on the diagram, which was written W, the bandwidth, times the log base 2 of a number that's dependent on the signal to noise ratio. What was useful and very amazing about Shannon's theorem was that people instantly now had an absolute speed limit beyond which they know they could not engineer, could not go. Uh, however, much like the speed of light, understanding the limit was not the same as understanding the engineering problems and understanding the design techniques and implementation uh, uh, techniques that are required to get through the channel as close to capacity as possible. Engineering digital communication systems has to do with finding engineering techniques to make information flow through corrupt additive noise channels with as high a speed and as much reliability as possible. My next topic is the pulse amplitude modulation model of a communication system. Uh, in and of itself, it is not important in that people usually do not build systems out of a PAM model, but as a building block, something that will allow us to understand more complex principles, it's very important. As you see here in the diagram, the PAM model has the same three elements that we saw on the previous slide, transmitter, channel, and receiver. Uh, the channel has a frequency characteristic that is a brick wall with good amplitude in a band equal to a bandwidth of W hertz and the additive no white noise element N sub W of T here in the diagram. It's the transmitter and receiver we wish to concentrate on here. Let's take the transmitter. We have two elements. One is a filter, which here we designate P sub zero of F, and also the element that gives us the energy to generate waveforms. It is, it is designated here A sub K times the impulse function. A sub K we might think of as one of an alphabet of values. If you will, this is the information impulse that is going to be carried over the channel and received at the other end. The receiver has a filter that corresponds to the transmit filter. We call it P sub 1 of F. And it has a sampler, which, as you'll see, is very important in understanding digital communications over this analog channel. Now, first question, what is the best way to design the two filters, P sub 0 and P1 of F? And without going through the mathematics, let me state the result. The result is that to secure very clean communication, in other words, to avoid inter-symbol interference between successive A sub K data values, the frequency characteristics, P0 times P1 of F, should be a constant value when viewed in what's called the sample data space. And why is that? Why is that an intuitively pleasing result that P0 times P1 should be a constant value when viewed in the sample domain? One way to appreciate that, looking at this next slide, is to consider one special case of P sub S of F being a constant value. And that is the case where we have the brick wall function from minus 1 over 2t to 1 over 2t, and we ask a question that almost every electrical engineer can answer, what is the time domain transform of such a frequency characteristic? And in fact, it is the so-called sync function, sine t over t, which has a very useful property. And that is, at time 0, the sync function has a finite value. And at every other time equal to a integral multiple of t, the sync function goes to 0. That means we can signal through this brick wall function, P of F, and at the other end, the only energy that is sampled at the sampler, which is opening and closing only at time K times T, the only value we sample is due to the pulse that was launched at one point in time at the transmitter. So 
the Nyquist criterion forces us to choose P sub F, filter functions in the transmit and receive sides of our communications device that limits the frequency in much the same way that C of F, the channel characteristic, has limited our ability to signal through the communications channel. The other element of designing a transmitter and receiver is to choose the alphabet, A sub K. And on that subject, we'll come back here in just a minute. Our next step is to generalize the PAM model to something that we refer to as the quadrature amplitude modulation model for a communication system. Here in the diagram, you can see what we've done. We've taken the PAM model, which is inherently a baseband model for communication, and we've added carrier modulation. And we've also brought in two of the PAM modulation systems with carrier modulation. If you notice, the first carrier we use is the so-called in-phase or cosine carrier uh, at F sub C, which is the carrier frequency value. The second chain in the QAM model uses the quadrature component or the sine value for 2 pi F sub C of T. Now, as most of the electrical engineers know, cosine and sine are orthogonal waveforms. By that, I mean that in the receiver, by using cosine and sine carriers, we can extract the two separate data streams that were the inputs of the two PAM models at the transmitter. So for example, if we use A sub K and B sub K, to represent the two streams of information at the transmit side, these exact two same streams can be recovered at the receiver through the QAM model. In addition, by introducing the notion of a carrier frequency, we've now laid the groundwork for what we will later refer to as frequency division multiple access that can be used both on wired and wireless systems to allow more users onto the carrier medium, in this case, the wireless or radio medium. Now, with the QAM model, another concept is very important and also very intuitive. And that is the notion of what is often referred to as signal space diagrams. Remember that I talked about two separate streams of symbols that are inputs to the transmitters in the QAM model. If we were to take all the possible values of A and B that are the inputs to the QAM model, and we were to plot them out, diagram them in XY two-dimensional space, we'd have signal space diagrams. For example, a very popular modulation method is called quadrature phase shift keying, or QPSK. QPSK is an example where the value of A sub K can be either plus or minus 1, and the value of B sub K can be either plus or minus 1. And therefore, the signal space diagram are four points, each occupying a place in one of the quadrants of the XY space. Another very popular modulation scheme is binary phase shift keying, or BPSK. Here, B sub K is held to zero, and A sub K can take on either plus or minus one as a value. Now, what, what use are these signal space diagrams? In fact, we will use the signal space diagrams now to discuss the performance of communication systems, of digital communication systems. And by performance, I mean probability of error in transmitting the signal through a noisy channel and receiving and estimating the proper values at the receive side of the channel. So as you see in the next diagram, communication engineers are in the habit of plotting the probability of error of any particular symbol against the signal to noise ratio that obtains on the communications channel. And to make these diagrams compact, the values are usually log-log. In other words, the probability of error is expressed 
as a logarithm, and same for the signal noise ratio. If we think about the probability of error, what causes an error in communications, and think about signal space, for example, the QPSK model of four points each in its own quadrant, an error is caused when additive noise carries the transmit point, say, for example, the 1, 1 point in the upper right-hand quadrant. When the noise carries that point beyond either of the two axes, x or y. And why is that? It's because our estimation strategy is to estimate the transmit value as that point that's closest to the receive value. So when noise carries us out of the region of closest distance to the ideal point, we say that an error is likely. And in fact, since the noise we are talking about is additive white Gaussian noise, the way to compute the error rate is to integrate the tail of the Gaussian distribution beyond the threshold point. And when one does that, we come up with what is referred to as the Q function, and a diagram of the Q function is in fact shown here as the probability of error as a function of signal-to-noise ratio. You'll notice that this curve is very steep, meaning that as we add relatively small amounts of signal-to-noise ratio, the error rates drop very fast. And one thing I can tell you as a hint, many communication engineers remember that for the QPSK modulation scheme, that error rate of 10 to the minus fifth, 1 in 100,000, happens to fall almost exactly at the signal-to-noise ratio point of 10 dB, or 10 times as much signal power as noise power, something you may uh, want for back-of-the-envelope calculations later on. Another point to be made while looking at this probability of error curve is that it is only really accurate for the additive white noise channel. And unfortunately, wireless communications very often is affected by other kinds of interference and other kinds of degradations other than white noise. So in fact, error rate curves on wireless channels are very rarely as nice and as steeply dropping as this curve that I show you here. But the intuition that one gains by understanding performance on the additive white Gaussian noise channel is very important for further development of practical systems. So for a moment, let's recap what we've learned. There is a practical method for signaling across a band-limited channel. There are ways of arranging the signal points within a quadrature modulation system that allow us good performance in noise. And in fact, these principles, this pulse amplitude modulation system and the QAM system, really are at the heart of many digital systems, including digital wireless systems. In the next diagram, I show a generalized picture of a transmitter for wireless communication, digital wireless communication. And I think you'll see that the principles we've now discussed are really only one part of the system. In fact, they're only one of four major pieces to this transmitter. So looking at the slide, we see in the block marked transmitter the equivalent of the transmitter part of the QAM diagram containing waveform shaping, carrier translation, and the selection of the alphabet. What are the other pieces that are here? And I think it's important we at least understand the terminology so that when you wish to gain more knowledge in this area, uh, you have some background. First of all, the source of the information in telephony, well, that's people, that's talking, that's speech, human speech. In data communication, it'll be a computer or a terminal, this kind of thing. But as we get into the communications function, the compression piece is very important, especially for voice communication. There is a great body of knowledge now on how to reduce the amount of digital information necessary to reproduce natural sounding speech at the receive end of a digital wireless link. Today, the state of the art is approximately at 8 kilobits per second, where natural sounding speech can be represented on such a low data rate signal. Compare this 
to what is currently used on most long distance wired systems, 64 kilobits per second. And you can see that much of the gains in capacity in wireless systems come from this exact box in the diagram, the compression system. The channel coder is used to improve the performance, increase the reliability of the communications across the channel. We have been talking up to now about pulse modulation systems. We have not talked about ways of adding additional bits, additional symbols that actually improve performance by building redundancy into the channel. Rather than quoting a lot of mathematics, let me appeal to your intuitive sense. In natural language, when two people are speaking, there is a lot of redundancy. In a single sentence, I may express the same kind of information several different ways. In fact, it's this redundancy which makes natural speech so reliable because what we do is we speak maybe faster to get more ideas and more symbols in our natural language, but the fact that the same ideas are expressed in slightly different ways allows the receiver, the listener, to gain certainty in the information that's being conveyed. <clears throat> and in a very general sense, that's what channel coders do. We add additional symbols that are often called parity bits. These parity bits are used to double check that the received information was received correctly. And then in many cases, in the cases of what are called forward error correction codes, not only can we check for errors, but we can actually select the right symbol more often than if we didn't have the parity check bits. So channel coders are very important for improving reliability across a wireless channel because of the special problems that we will encounter and which we will discuss here in a moment. The final block that I feel is important to discuss is access control. And access control is incredibly important and one would say essential in wireless communications because unlike cabled or wired systems, in radio communication all of the users are sharing the same medium, which are the radio waves, much the same as we uh, share one ocean and share the atmosphere. We have to all participate in the use of the radio spectrum. Carrying forward on the receiver, we see that the same elements have counterparts in the receiver section of a generalized wireless digital communication system. Because the functions are the counterparts, very similar to what I just discussed, I won't go through each of their functions. They should be obvious. However, I, I should point out that it's an interesting fact in the actual engineering of these systems that when one is transitioning from an analog medium to a digital medium, the complexity of the block is much greater than its counterpart, which is going from digital to analog. So as they say from the synthesis function of digital to analog, we have simpler functions, generally one half to one third as much complexity measured either in the number of gates or the number of instructions per second that must be implemented. In the case of the receiver, the first two blocks, the receiver and the channel decoder, are in some sense helping us move from the analog medium of the communications channel to the digital medium of the bits that we're producing. These blocks are anywhere from three to ten times greater in complexity than their counterparts on the transmitter. However, the decompression phase is actually moving from the digital bits being delivered to the analog mediums, such as voice. It turns out that the compression stage is generally three to five times greater in complexity than the decompression stage in the receiver. So interestingly, these two systems offset each other. So the transmitters and receiver functions in wireless systems are comparable in complexity. Earlier, I mentioned that the access control part of the communication system was very important for wireless. Many users are all accessing a common base station and from the point of view of each user, they wish to have complete and continuous use of the spectrum for the time that they want a call to be completed or a data transfer to be effected. Unlike wired systems, it's not possible to create new radio spectrum. In a wired system, 
to create new capacity, one lays a new cable. Not so with radio. On the other hand, the advent of cellular systems in some way created an opportunity to reuse radio spectrum. The FCC in the United States has allocated 25 megahertz of spectrum for analog cellular, which is being converted to digital cellular. These 25 megahertz, although it seems like a lot of spectrum, are inadequate if only one use of that frequency is, done, is made in a city. For example, in New York, where there may be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of users, it is necessary to reuse the 25 megahertz of spectrum over and over again in order to give adequate capacity, in other words, to avoid busy signals all the time, especially during rush hours. This concept of the reuse of spectrum is very fundamental to the whole notion of cellular and microcellular systems. In fact, the idea of a cluster of cells is important. Within a cluster, all of the frequencies are only used once. And so clusters are really, in some sense, a whole universe by themselves since all of the spectrum is used once. And in the adjoining cluster, the same frequencies are reused. And later, when I talk about co-channel interference, I'm referring to the fact that even though we're using a certain frequency here in this cell within this cluster, I may every so often receive stray energy on the same frequency from another cell in another cluster. This complicates the job of reception and reliable performance in wireless digital communication systems. So in what ways do we wish to divide up the spectrum within a particular cell or within a particular cluster of cells. That is the meaning of access control or multiple access. In other words, given a piece of the spectrum that is available within a cell, how do we bring many users onto that spectrum, onto and off of that spectrum? There are three general methods, and in very rapid succession, I'm going to introduce each of the methods. The first, the oldest, and in some ways the simplest to understand, is frequency division multiple access, FDMA, with frequency division duplex use in the transmit and receive directions. As you can see in the diagram, the nature of FDMA is really intrinsic to the QAM model that we introduced earlier. The carrier frequency in QAM, F sub C, is varied so that as we have a new information stream, A sub K and B sub K, we change the carrier frequency, F sub C, so that the new spectrum created does not overlap the one next to it. In other words, the channel spacing, the difference between one F sub C and the next one, must be greater than the bandwidth of the information bearing signal. FDD, frequency division duplex, means that not only do we divide the spectrum by FDMA in the downlink, for example, from the base station to the mobile station, but in bringing signals back from the mobile station to the base station, we go, go on to a whole new set of frequencies. We frequency division duplex transmit and receive so that neither encounter the other in the same piece of spectrum. For example, in the United States, in its cellular allocations, 25 megahertz are allocated for the downlink or base station to mobile system direction, and another 25 megahertz disjoint are allocated for the uplink from the mobile station to the base station. Notice that FDMA techniques are very often used in conjunction with the next two techniques that I'm going to describe. Time division multiple access, or TDMA, allows multiple users onto the same carrier frequency at virtually the same time, but not exactly the same time. To the user of a mobile station, a handset, using a TDMA system, they will not have any knowledge or awareness 
that other users are on the same frequency. And the reason is that the engineering solution provides for separate points in time where each of the mobile systems either transmit or receive their particular packet of information. As you can see in the diagram, in the downlink direction from the base station, trains of information destined for mobile station 1, mobile station 2, and mobile station 3 are aligned serially in time, and the mobile stations have to be aware, have to look for their addresses, so they pick off the right packet of information for them. In the uplink direction from the mobile station to the base station, the situation is more complex. And the reason is that it's far less important when the mobile station transmits as it is when the transmitted information arrives at the base station. So each mobile station must launch its uplink pulse or pulses at the right moment in time so they arrive in perfect serial order at the receiver and we gain the most utilization of the channel by this TDMA time synchronization. TDMA techniques are well known. They were pioneered in satellite communications 25 years ago. They are now relatively simple to implement with the superior electronics that has come forward from the semiconductor industry. Note that TDMA can be used in two different formats in transmit and receive duplexing. Earlier I talked about frequency division duplexing in FDMA. That is where the downlink and uplink work on separate frequencies. In the United States, in its digital cellular systems, for example, IS-54 and IS-95, these systems use TDMA, but they also use frequency division duplex, so that downlink signals are on one set of frequencies, 25 megahertz, and the uplink signals are completely separated. There is another way to implement TDMA, and that is a system called time division duplex, where both the uplink and downlink share the same frequency. Now there are some special advantages to a time division duplex system, which I will get to later when we talk about techniques in radio system engineering. But I want to point out that time division duplex and frequency division duplex are both available for TDMA systems. Finally, the third of the multiple access techniques I wish to describe is a technique known as code division multiple access, which is a special case of spread spectrum technology. And this technology was actually first experimented on and implemented in the 40s, uh, some in World War II for military communications, both to avoid jamming and to avoid interception. What is the difference between these CDMA, code division multiple access techniques, or spread spectrum techniques, and the other techniques? <clears throat> the simplest way for me to describe spread spectrum, or CDMA, is to go back to our PAM model, the pulse amplitude modulation system that we talked about earlier. In that system, we produced a waveform that represented the information, and then that waveform was then taken on to a carrier. Imagine, as you see here in the slide, that we add one more step between the PAM modulation and the carrier modulation. And that step is the spreading step. It's an additional modulation that is implemented with a spreading waveform. I've shown here in the diagram the spreading waveform and designated it with a capital W, which in fact stands for Walsh. The Walsh waveforms have a very interesting set of properties, and that is that in a family of Walsh functions, none of them correlate with each other. They have almost zero correlation with each other, and each has an autocorrelation function that is almost an impulse, meaning that if we slightly delay the Walsh function and 
multiply it with itself, we have an almost random output. Why are these, why are these properties important? The reason they're important is shown in the next slide. If we take a look at a very, very simple waveform, actually a square pulse, and now that we're experts in Nyquist criteria, we know that we've generated some inter symbol interference, but that's okay. Let's assume we have a very wide band channel. This very simple pulse with a relatively narrow spectrum, as shown to the right, is now modulated with a very fast moving Walsh function. This spreads the spectrum on the radio channel. It, it, it drives it out. For example, in the US IS95 CDMA system, the ratio or the processing gain of the Walsh functions is 64 to 1. So that instead of having approximately a 20,000 hertz wide spectrum, we have a spectrum that is 1.2 megahertz wide. One might ask, why take a narrow signal and spread it all over, all over the, the spectrum? The reason is that by using the Walsh functions in the receiver to demodulate and decorrelate the received signals, we can recover only the signal that was modulated by the original Walsh function that we had. So in fact, a particular mobile station can pick out only the signal destined for it by using the correct Walsh function and recovering the exact phase of the transmitter Walsh function. So in the final diagram here, what we show is that on the radio channel itself in the A diagram, we see that we have a very wide spectrum that contains all 64 users, actually 62 users in IS-95. And if it so happens that a very hot and narrow interferer drops into the channel, when we decorrelate with the Walsh function at the receiver, only one signal pops up and has significant energy in the receiver behind the receive filter in the spread spectrum system. And that is the function that we want, the one that was modulated with our Walsh function. So what are the benefits of a spread spectrum system? Well, the benefits, the first one is the one that the military discovered that, that uh, hostile jammers, or in this case, inadvertent jammers that have very high energy uh, are mitigated by spreading the energy out beyond the acceptance limits of the receive filter. Uh, but also it turns out there's another, another function here, and that is it is possible to build what are called rake receivers, or receivers with multiple arms that can look for different versions of our Walsh function that are fractionally delayed one from the other. By collecting these multiply delayed signals, we can then combine them in a coherent fashion and get better performance at our receiver. So this is a form of what is called diversity. It's often called a time diversity function. And there is an analogy for this in both FDMA and TDMA systems that we will come to later. I've talked about the benefits of the spread spectrum system. There are some potential negatives to the system. First off, obviously it's more complex since it has all the elements of our other systems, but it also includes this additional modulation and synchronization and demodulation functions. So it is more complex. It has an element of self-jamming because it is not possible to completely eliminate the effects of the other users in the channel. So there is some amount of interference generated by the other Walsh function modulated waveforms in the channel. And finally, there is a danger that one of the other users becomes what is often referred to as a rogue, a rogue transmitter, where the very fine gain control, power control, can be lost, and this signal comes in and becomes a very effective jammer on the other users of the channel. So although this is a sometimes referred to as a third generation technology, uh, there are some in the field who view its potential weaknesses as areas of caution. It is now, CDMA is now being field trialed, and there are a number of carriers who have announced cellular systems based on IS-95. Now we turn to issues that are related to radio propagation.
And the first thing to understand is that the simple models of radio wave or RF propagation don't apply very well in the cases of cellular and even microcellular communications. Uh, one way to understand it and to illustrate this is to look here on the slide, where on the first line I show the so-called range equation for free space propagation of radio waves. If you notice in this equation, there are two very important elements. The range equation shows that the loss of signal power is a function of the square of distance between a radio transmitter and a radio receiver. And in addition, the signal falls off as the square of the frequency of propagation as well. Now, from many, many tests and much experimental information, the case of terrestrial wireless communication has been plotted by many researchers and many carrier companies. And on the next line, I show the kind of range equation or loss equation that this experimental information gives us. And notice how little similarity there is between the two expressions. First off, the loss varies not as the inverse square of distance, but as 1 over r raised to the fourth power. So imagine how much more quickly we lose energy in the terrestrial case, where we have many scatterers and absorbers and ground clutter. Secondly, because of this very heavy loss against distance, we find that the loss against frequency is, in effect, washed out. To first order, there is no dependency on frequency in this equation. And lastly, there is an inverse correlation, if you will. There is actually less loss as we raise the height of the transmit and receive antennas. So in fact, the only important variables in terrestrial wireless communication are the distance between transmit and receive and the height of the antennas above the mean ground level. On the next slide, we show a quantitative expression of this second equation. This is reproduced from the CCIR chart of propagation, and it shows that while there is some dependency on frequency, so that the higher the frequency, the greater the loss, by far the strong dependence on distance overwhelms the difference based on frequency. So now we've learned that radio propagation in wireless systems is more difficult and very different than what we might learn in school about the propagation of radio waves through a vacuum or through air. In fact, rather than white noise additive channels being the dominant error-producing effects in wireless systems, really interference and what is called multipath propagation really dominate performance in many wireless systems. <clears throat> Even though using digital communication techniques lowers or lessens the effect of both co-channel and adjacent channel interference, these kinds of interference effects still plague us in these systems. But what is even worse is that in many systems there is no direct line of sight between the transmitter and the receiver in a wireless communications application. That means that the energy we must work on at the receiver is coming from various reflected paths. And as you might guess, these reflected paths are not equal in length, nor are they equal in attenuation. So at the receiver, we are receiving many different versions of this same signal that we wish to receive in the same frequency band and often in the same time slot, such as in the TDMA case. So how is it that we build receivers that can resolve these differences? Well, let me first say it's a tough problem. And in the second case, looking at this next slide, we talk about the technique called diversity or diversity receivers. A very good way to consider the problem of multipath propagation is not to worry about the multiple signals that are arriving at the receiver, but rather to think of this as a wave-like phenomenon, much as when we see waves 
coming from two stones dropped in a pool, standing wave patterns result, and there are places where the signal is constructively built up and other places where the signal is destructively beaten down. Obviously, we would like to put our antenna where the multiple signals constructively interfere and build up actually to greater amplitude. By using multiple antennas and multiple receivers at the communications receiving device, we can actually choose electronically the best of the receivers, and we can even do more. We can combine the energy from multiple receivers, differentially amplify or attenuate them, differentially delay them, and build them up to constructively add them in before we go to final estimation of the transmit symbols. This technique of diversity reception is very important and in fact I would say maybe the most important of the techniques that must be used to truly improve performance in city type applications where there is usually no line of sight available. A second technique called equalization is used when there is not only multipath propagation but when there are very large cells and where the bandwidth of the signal is very broad. Equalization must be used sometimes in addition to diversity receivers and in fact the equalizer you can think of as an electronic neural network system that learns the nature of the analog channel that has been constructed from the multipath propagation and inverts the signal by building a frequency characteristic exactly matching and complementary to the effective multipath channel. This is a very tough problem and without the advent of very high speed and inexpensive digital signal processors it would be virtually impossible to deliver this kind of performance at costs low enough to attract consumers. Let me go back to an idea I mentioned briefly earlier and that is in diversity systems, we wish to choose the antenna that sits at the right constructive point in the waveform pattern. And if you recall, I said that time division duplex systems have a special advantage in diversity. Now, why, why is that? The reason is that in time division duplex, TDD systems, both the uplink and downlink systems, or if you will, the transmit and receive signals at a base station, are coming in and going out on the same frequency. So that if we select a receive antenna that is at the highest point of constructive interference, it turns out by a principle called reciprocity in electromagnetic theory that that same antenna will give superior performance for the transmit or downlink side of the system. So if, if you consider this, that means that in time division duplex, TDD systems, there is no need to build a diversity system at the mobile side, the mobile station. The, the, the diversity systems at the base station are adequate in general to satisfy the improvement of performance at both ends. This can yield very nice economic benefits in building these systems. Another point which really now leads us into our economic discussion is that in TDD systems only one frequency is being generated and used and there are very nice opportunities for the radio system designer to decrease the number of components, the size, weight, and power used. In fact, a, an item that is usually called a duplexer, which in fact separates transmit from receive frequencies at the antenna of a mobile system is no longer required since the antenna is only used alternately for transmit and receive and of course in this case always on the same frequency. So the duplexer is eliminated as one example and that means that there is less loss to the transmitter, better battery life and lower weight. Since we've started talking about economic issues let's continue. Some of the greatest concerns of both users and carriers is the use of the spectrum. I mentioned earlier that it is necessary to reuse spectrum over and over again. The use of digital encoding and compression techniques certainly helps with this. Also the use of smaller and smaller cells is very important 
in order to allow multiple reuses of the spectrum. In future systems, you will see that the density of users is quoted in thousands of Erlangs, or if you will, thousands of simultaneous users per square kilometer. A very, very tough measure to meet, but possible with these newer digital systems. The next major issue under the economic heading is battery life and battery cost. Battery cost, unlike semiconductor cost, does not drop in a nice monotonic and rapid fashion year to year. So the optimization of power and the minimization of power draw is very important. Digital systems, unlike analog systems, can operate very close to a minimum threshold of operation without yielding any degradation in the qualitative value, the qualitative benefits that it yields. In other words, a voice system in a, in a digital context sounds just as good, just 1 dB better than threshold, as it does 10 dB better than threshold in signal-to-noise ratio. That is not the case with analog systems that degrade in a smooth fashion, but sometimes very annoying fashion, as we lose signal power. Also, with digital systems, it's possible to implement very accurate and very fast-acting power control so that we never transmit more power over the radio channel than we absolutely need to meet threshold. This is not only true of the TDMA systems, but it's absolutely required in the CDMA systems for the reason I stated earlier about rogue transmitters. Finally, and maybe most important of all, it's possible to implement with great accuracy discontinuous sleep modes for the devices so that the transmitter, for example, does not stay on in between the time when we're actually actively talking on a system. And furthermore, when we're waiting to get a call, we do not have to leave the receiver on at all times, but rather it can wake up, listen for a, a designation of our number to see if a call is waiting, and then go to sleep again. The last item under economics, of course, are the technology issues, specifically the semiconductors. Silicon continues to drop in cost as the uh, channel spacing becomes smaller and smaller and the technology improves. But as we go forward, we're now finding that radio frequency circuits can now be implemented in monolithic form. So-called microwave monolithic ICs, MMIC, are going to be very important in the lowering of cost, size, and power as we go forward. If you recall earlier, I showed you a digital cordless telephone from Japan, and that unit incorporates many microwave monolithic devices to attain its very small size and weight. So all of these items, spectrum efficiency, battery life, technology drivers such as semiconductors, and reuse of spectrum, these are all incredibly important in calculating and comparing uh, different system costs going forward. And as you can see, a carrier will look at the economic issues in some ways very differently than a subscriber. The subscriber wishes to have the lightest and least expensive piece of equipment in his or her hand, whereas the, the carrier, of course, wishes the same thing, but also has great interest in giving simultaneous service to as many users as possible within a particular geographic area and on a very limited piece of radio spectrum. As we consider cellular versus microcellular systems, of course, from a, from a carrier's point of view, having more cells gives us more capacity, but of course, at the cost of more capital investment, since each of the base stations must be sited and built. And of course, it has to be staffed sometimes with part-time service people. Notice as the radio frequency goes up, for example, from 8 or 900 megahertz, which is typical for large cellular systems, to 1.9 or 2.1 gigahertz, 1900 to 2100 megahertz for microcellular systems, it is the case that our propagation is much harder to implement. Put a different way, trees, other foliage, buildings absorb more strongly at the higher frequencies than they do at the lower frequencies. This tells us that implementing very large cells at the higher frequencies will be more difficult, more costly in the sense that more power will have to be generated.
Now, again, the smaller the cell, the more capacity we have. But notice, as I showed you on these small telephones here, the smaller the cell, the less we have to build large transmitters in the radio, the battery can be smaller, and so on. The subscriber will like these telephones much better. So why not build very small cells again? Well, there's the capital investment. But there's one other problem, and that is related to what's called handoff between cells. As we know, in cellular systems, when we're in an automobile moving very rapidly, we depend on the overall system, the overall communication system, to affect seamless handoff from one cell to the next. If we make the cells very, very small, the handoffs come much more rapidly, and the problem of orchestrating the handoffs over an entire city become very complex and, in fact, very costly. So when we put all of these issues and problems together, one starts to wonder if cellular systems might not be best suited for the lower frequencies at 8 or 900 megahertz. And as we go to the higher frequencies, the smaller cells are more natural. But notice, maybe it's going to be too difficult and too costly to provide full mobility in the early going of the high frequency microcellular rollout. So I would predict that in the early going, the microcellular systems may have less complete mobility, but they will offer much smaller handsets. And it's possible that the carriers can provide the services of the microcellular systems at lower cost per minute than they now offer fully mobile large cellular systems. In our last section, I wish to set our discussion of the engineering principles in a historical context and show you some timelines which illustrate when various cellular and microcellular systems were first put into the field. And as you'll see, mobile communications for commercial and consumer use are relatively recent events in electrical engineering history. In this first diagram, we're looking at various analog cellular systems which have been put in place. The first was the Japanese system called JTAX, which was first implemented in 1979 and is currently in, in operation today. As we go forward, we see a Nordic mobile system in 1981, and then the very popular AMPS system, which is the system used in the United States almost without variation on what was first put in the field in 1983. In fact, today, far more users of AMPS are in the field than was ever predicted. As of the end of 1993, over 12 million subscribers in the United States use AMPS cellular phones, a truly remarkable number. We can see other forms of analog cellular in 1985 and 86. These are minor variations on other systems already shown. Both of these happen to be most popular in Europe, TAX and the NMT Nordic system at 900 megahertz. The last two are interesting to mention. In 1989 and 1990, narrowband analog systems were put in place, first in Japan and then in some parts of the United States. And these narrowband systems used much the same basic technology as the first analog cellular systems, but they used half the channel width in our FDMA model or QAM model than the former systems. And they used some superior techniques for FM shaping of the signals to attain comparable quality to the voice signals. But these narrowband systems are probably the end of the line in the evolution of the analog system with one exception, and that is an exception that we call cellular digital packet data, CDPD, which is a system that was first put in field trial in 1992 and is now coming into full implementation in 1994. This system overlays a packet data capability over currently existing AMPS systems. Because there are over 12 million users and the number is gaining every day, it is likely that many AMP systems will remain in place for many years to come. And the CDPD system uses some of the principles we talked about earlier today, if you will, to steal time on the FDMA channels when voice traffic is not being born on the channel 
to send high rate 19.2 kilobit bursts of data through the system. As we move toward digital cellular systems and we go to the next slide, we see that there's been a veritable burst of activity in the last three years in bringing digital cellular systems into the field that truly implement many of the techniques that we've talked about during this discussion. 1990, Japanese digital cellular based on TDMA technology, TDMA frequency division duplex. 1991, in the United States, a TDMA system referred to as IS-54, which is almost the same as Japanese digital cellular, but operating on slightly wider channel spacings, 30 kilohertz instead of 25. The GSM technology, which has gone into wide implementation across Europe using, a, again, a TDMA FDD approach. Much wider bandwidth, though, 270 kilobits per second, 200 kilohertz channel spacing. And because of the wide channel spacing, it is very important in GSM technology to have superior equalization techniques to offset what I referred to earlier as frequency selective fading. 1993, and we have the granting of a standard to the CDMA camp called IS-95. So far, the CDMA technology has not been put into wide-scale revenue-bearing uh, application. Moving toward microcellular technology, or what is often referred to as personal communication systems, PCS, we have a different timeline. In this one, we see a number of European standards mapped out starting in 1987 where the so-called second generation cordless telephone or CT2 technology was first standardized and then put into the field in 1991 and 1992. CT2 technology, however, has been overrun by a more broadly accepted and more flexible technology coming called DECT. And DECT technology was first standardized in 1988 and is only now being fully adopted as a standard. The great benefit of DECT over the CT2 is its higher bandwidth and greater flexibility of use. And so most speculation is that DECT technology will be used for both office and home use for such applications as wireless PBX in the office. Imagine coming to your office in the morning, putting a telephone in your pocket, and taking calls meant for you anywhere in the confines of your office premises. Also sketched out are more recent events, such as in 1992, the adoption of RCR28, or the personal handy phone PHP standard in Japan, which is now in field trial and will be going to full consumer use sometime later in 1994 and 1995. The small telephone I showed earlier is an RCR28 compatible telephone. And finally, and maybe for those of us living here in the United States, most exciting is the fact that the Federal Communications Commission here in the United States, the FCC, in the latter part of 1993 granted or proposed to grant in a report in order, 160 megahertz of spectrum at 1.9 and 2.1 gigahertz for use in personal communication systems. If you look at this next slide, you will see that the FCC has granted many different potential uses of this spectrum. To point out two important differences here, you'll notice that some of the bands have a U for unlicensed as a designator. That is because these bands will not be granted to any particular carrier for tariff bearing application, but rather will be open much the same way as cordless telephones are used on an unlicensed band now in the United States, so that various manufacturers can implement systems for private use, such as in homes or offices also for use in LAN, wireless local area network applications for data. The other bands, however, 
will be allocated to various carriers who wish to provide service for tariffs, of course. And there is speculation that many different possible systems will be implemented, including what are referred to as high-tier or fully mobile systems with relatively large cells, as well as low-tier or limited mobility systems, microcells. As I mentioned earlier, it is my speculation that the microcell systems will have the earliest initial acceptance at these higher frequencies, although nothing is to say that the technology can be approved and the costs reduced to provide very large cell fully mobile systems here at 2.1 and 1.9 gigahertz. So in summary, we have covered four different areas that are all related. We've talked about digital communications principles. We've related that to RF propagation theory and some issues there that are very specific to wireless systems. We've talked about some of the implications for the economics of these digital wireless systems. And finally, we've tried to set all of this in a historical perspective. And I'm hoping that you can use these principles and these facts to allow yourself better participation as these technologies come to the fore, either as a user or as a designer of these kinds of systems. I thank you for listening and for your attention. And I hope you make some good use of your cellular knowledge as you go forward. Thank you.